Did you know that although Costa Rica is plentiful in water, there are still many challenges in providing water and sanitation to rural communities? This is the Levers of Exchange podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Gia. Today's guest is Joaquin Viquez. As a technical advisor to the German development agency, GIZ, he is helping to address some of the regional, local, and hyperlocal water and sanitation issues. Season three is brought to you by a generous grant from the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at the Said Business School, Oxford University. If you're new to this podcast, please don't forget to subscribe. Now, let's listen to how Joaquin uses his background as the son of a farmer to tackle agriculture and water issues in his home country. Joaquin, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting. I'd like to start off with by asking about your background. You grew up from an agriculture family. And can you give us a little bit of context of what that means and how that shaped your childhood? Yeah, so Costa Rica has been dedicated to agriculture for, for many centuries, and my family wasn't the exception. I grew up in a family. Initially, my dad was chocolate farmer or cacao, and then coffee farmer, and then livestock farmer. And so for me, those memories are like a mix of honestly, uh, smells. And so even though I was very young, for example, when I grew up, when my dad was growing cacao, and I, I don't remember seeing it, every time I smell it, for somehow I, I like transport over time and feel in a different uh, time era. Growing in that sort of environment was very nurturing in, in the sense of being very close to, uh, to nature and sort of valuing what that means. One of the things that you've mentioned in some of your other works is how you view problems through experience and problems through the act of doing and implementing. Can you explain that a little bit? And how does your background then frame the work that you do today? Like looking, growing up in the, in the farming side of things and, and sort of looking at the same, of the, of the struggles that my, say my dad would, would go through at farming level. And then later on my early times in, in my career, looking at the issues of, of farmers through that experience of just kind of visiting them and just hearing out their their struggles. I can't do this or I can't do that because of, of this. Obviously, we had a lot of sort of uh, apple, not apple trees, um, fruit trees in, in our property. And one of them was guayaba, which is very similar to an apple in the sense. And I just remember there's a season that the tree just blows up, right, with, with, with fruit. All the fruits fall to the ground and you just can't eat them as, as, as quick. And I just remember looking at that sort of wasteful moment in time and being like, can we, can we do something about it? And I remember like testing different things. Obviously, nothing made sense then. But I think that's sort of my expression of, of looking at problems through, through experience. And how old were you when you had that formative moment? I was trying to think back. That probably early teens, 12, 13, 14 what were some of the things you tried to do with the extra fruit? I always tried. I, I <laughs> for some interesting reason, I, I thought that it would be they would decompose really quickly, and so they, it would get really wet. And so I thought maybe we could extract water from it, even though it was like pouring outside. Never thought of like the things that I do now, like energy or or compost. There was a lot of worms uh, in the process. I thought maybe those could do something. I think being a teenager, we could forgive you for not having complete <laughs> thoughts in those situations. But then let's fast forward many years, and you won Technology Review 35, TR35, which is 35 innovators under 35 uh, from MIT. That award was given to you for, in some ways, an extension of this idea. It was. It definitely was. Fast forward, or not even that much, but not long after that, I I got into, um, I was early, early teens, maybe 16 or, or, or 17. I was fascinated by worm composting. I don't know if you've ever uh, heard of worm composting, but you use worms to decompose materials. And I would use cow manure, which I had been smelling since a kid, right? So it was like very natural for me to like work with this sort of material. And that was what took me into working in my first job with a dairy co-op and helping farmers manure management, which eventually took me to founding my, my company, Biogas, that looked at producing energy from cow manure, which took me to, the, to this uh, MIT recognition. 
Yeah. So talk a little bit about that technology that you did. What was it trying to do and what type of biogas were you creating and what problem were you solving? I mean, biogas has been been uh, uh, around for, for quite a while. I got into it when I was in, in college, Earth University in Costa Rica, which promotes a lot of uh, sustainable practices, had been uh, implementing it for quite a while. So I really got fascinated and, and loved the, the idea of producing something out of what we would look as nothing. I eventually started specializing myself in it, did my thesis, my bachelor's thesis on it, and started working on my first, uh, that first job that I was mentioning, the co-op. I was visiting farmers and I would come in very passionately would sort of convince them to do this technology that would produce methane out of their waste that they could use that for, to power some of the equipment on the farm. And at the end of the visit, they would say, let's do this. And then they would say, where do we get it? Where, where do we buy it? Or, you know, and that's where now I, I realized that there was nothing, there was, there was no one offering. So then I quit that job and started that uh, company. And then obviously there was a, a lot of struggles and iterating process of, of creating this technology that was affordable for small farmers. So in essence, the problem I was solving, it was like a, uh, like a try, I, I, like a, I call it like, it's not a one problem, but it was like attacking three things at the same time was trying to look to how to empower farmers by creating a uh, value added out of their something that they considered waste. Uh, second was an environmental issue of treating that waste that currently it wasn't. And third was sort of also tackling the sort of the climate change side of things of creating renewable energy, uh, reducing emissions from that mistreated waste, et cetera. So that, that, was, that was sort of the, the purpose. Could you talk a little bit, elaborate a little bit about the side effects of the manure itself? Because it does uh, create a lot of methane if it's left untreated. So what was that specific problem you were solving from the climate side? Let's say when, when if you're a dairy farmer or a pig farmer, which is what I transitioned to eventually advising pig farms, typically operations are, what's, uh, what's the word? I'm, I'm missing the word, but when animals are kept all in, 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 in sort of in the same spot, uh, manure is produced in, in very uh, big quantities. So when it's clean, when the facilities are clean and washed, all the manure tends to go into ideally a treatment system. The treatment system will depend on the regulations of the region, but in Latin America with sort of lacking regulations or lacking enforcements, they end up just sitting in ponds. When they sit in those ponds, they decompose and they release methane. So in essence, biogas technology, what it does is that it collects that methane and then it uses it for something. And when it, it's used, you burn it into CO2 and sort of you go to the natural cycle, reducing emissions quite a bit. And that's in the best case scenario, right? The worst case scenario is that the manure is dumped directly into uh, waterways, which I saw um, a lot, unfortunately. It's one of those issues that not that many people pay attention to, but yet the dairy manure pig manure, there's just so much energy that's built into it that if we can put it together and harvest it somehow, it's quite impactful. What were some of the value added benefits that you were able to give to the farmers? So we had, I mean, there's, there's those cases that I, I, I can't, uh, I can't ever forget, but the, especially the first farmers that we served, these guys were in a stage of almost shutting down their, their farm because they were being pressured by maybe a, a, the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Environment saying, listen, you can't continue dumping your waste into waterways. It's their first, they're, they're, it's their only source of income. So when you come in and you say, well, let's, let's solve this issue, this legal issue with the public entities, and then this sort of solution offers them this new product that they didn't have before, and like say biogas, and then all of a sudden they're they're reducing their bill on they didn't even use gasoline they use um, bunker or fuel oil mm. which is this very nasty uh, fuel for to power their uh, furnace and so then they they just can't believe how an issue became this like opportunity and I can't uh, forget that maybe a year in he calls me back and says hey Joaquin uh, and I said oh no well, what's wrong did something you know is it not working he said no 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 everything is working great. I was wondering if we, how, how can we produce more biogas? <laughs> <laughs> and so he was, you know, can, can I put more pigs? And I said, well, I mean, well, now you're sort of twisting things, right? You're treating your waste, but now you're looking into putting more waste. 
Uh, let's just keep things how it is. I think you're you're doing <laughs> just fine. That's a really cool story. One of the fascinating things that I read about the biodigester that you were installing was that you can personalize it. And I have never heard of a personalized biodigester before. How do you personalize a biodigester? So, yeah, the, the personalization of, of things is when I started thinking of the idea of getting into biogas for small-scale farmers, I remember reading literature, especially U.S. literature, saying the minimum size or, or minimal number of cattle that you can have, that you should have in order for it to be profitable, was like 500 head. I was like, well, there's, you know, there's a very, like a handful of farmers in Costa Rica that have that many cattle. And so then the concept of personalization was, let's visit the farm and let's see what they have and let's work with that, right? So you can't ever adapt the farm to the technology, but the technology to the farm. So that personalization was sort of thinking in that mindset of being a farmer, which growing up as a farmer was very helpful. What were some of the issues that the farmers would ask you? And then also then, what were the factors that you could tweak for each individual case? At the beginning of, of the story, it tend to be very reactive, meaning they would call me up and say, hey, listen, I just got a, a letter from, from the Ministry of Health saying that I have 15 days to fix this or, or I need to shut down. So th that was sort of the problem. When you visit the farm, you realize that there's other things that are, are of an issue. And so then the things that we could tweak was, you know, mainly like sort of the type of system we could put or the size. I try to be very flexible, right? Because at the, if you only have this one model, then sometimes it's too big for some farmers, too small for other farmers. So try to have a lot of flexibility, basically. And helping the livelihood and being able to fit into the small farm owners is really important to be able to maintain that economic competitiveness right yeah. across wide group of people. And I think that's that was the, the strongest motivator. I knew that if I had one model, but if I could make one model $100 cheaper, right, make it a little bit smaller, I, I knew that I could access another, you know, s several dozens of farm of farmers that that 100 bucks would make a huge difference. And it ended up being quite successful and getting scaled to quite a number of countries. Yeah, so we, we didn't do too bad. It definitely a struggle. It was a social business. I didn't have any any initial funding. People always say, "Hey, how how did you make it so far?" I was like, "I have I, I don't know. I, I have no idea." I I, I remember taking uh, a few, I think like five hundred bucks out of my first what is it called like the the liquidation or the, the 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 yearly bonus from my first job and just sort of setting up a website. Not that the website was the the main thing, but just to have an image of the of the business selling the first systems and, and then just kind of growing, bootstrapping the business all the way up. And then it got to the point where I needed to fundraise and I started too late and I just couldn't. So I had to actually halt the business back a few years, maybe like three years ago, but then sort of twist things around and ended up uh, selling it last year. So how did you then pivot from something working in biogas to now working in water issues. What's the connection there? Uh, it's a huge connection. So before I started the business or sort of in the, in the middle of things, I, I got a Fulbright scholarship and I ended up going to the U.S. and did a master's in environmental science and engineering. And biogas sort of falls into this realm of water treatment or wastewater treatment, right? It's, it's usually used as a primary technology. And so I was able to train myself, say, technically a little bit deeper understanding of how these systems work, how to optimize the designs. But obviously, I couldn't get away from wastewater treatment. Obviously, some of our clients or say the pig farmers, they yeah, we, we could put the biogas system, but the water had to be treated further. And so we also got into putting other other treatment systems along the way. And so I was always working in that the same world of wastewater treatment just more focus on what we call anaerobic to be very technical, but, but biogas. And now I'm, I, I pivoted into this project on water and sanitation in the region. Can you give us an overview of what are the key issues of wastewater treatment and sanitation? It's interesting because the issues on, on wastewater in the region, it's, it's almost analog to the same issues I would see at a farm level, right? It's lack of infrastructure, um, lack of knowledge, lack of funding to invest in these things, little enforcements, sort of like decades behind in, in treatment. And that's exactly what I see now in 
in say urban or peri-urban sanitation, which is which I'm 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 fairly new to to this, even though I you know I have a master's in it, but mostly working for rural. Now I'm moving to peri-urban and urban sanitation. I see this sort of the same issues. And so it seems like it's much more lack of infrastructure, knowledge, regulations, social awareness. It's not so much lack of technology. The technology mm-hmm. seems just needs to be implemented in some sort of a way. Definitely. I mean, we, we, and when I say we, uh, as, as the, the engineers or techno, technoists, I don't know if that's even a word, but we tend to think that it's the lack of technology. But I mean, wastewater has been, it, it's, it's ready. It's ready for deployment. It's, it's how we put it there that, that makes a huge difference. There's obviously tweaking. How do we make it cheaper? How do we make it easier to operate? But in essence, it's deploying it. It's, it's setting it on the ground. Now, can you give us an example then of how water issues are similar or different depending on the different scales and level of granularities? Does Costa Rica as a country have a sanitation issue that's different than, let's say, the regional scale? Because regional now we're starting to talk about urban versus rural and peri-urban, like you were saying, um, all the way down to like an individual farmer. So when you look at it from national to regional to, to localized, do the issues change? Well, I mean, it, they change in, in I, I would say they change in forms of of how they're viewed, right? So the people that are looking at, at the national issue, I can talk a little bit of the Costa Rica case, even though I'm not actually so familiar. And this project is regional, so we we're working all the way from Mexico down to Suriname on the Caribbean side. But say Costa Rica has a national water policy, a sanitation policy. And then as that policy trickles down to, say, the local, regional, and then individual, you see that the trickling of information, it varies depending on who's, who's sitting on that spot, right? So maybe the policy will say, we, you know, we want cleaner rivers, but when it comes down to the, to the community, the river is not clean. And it's because it's, there's a lot of lacking steps in, in between. As I mentioned already, typically funding even political will, prioritization, sometimes, you know, they want to do sanitation, but at the same time, roads are, are crappy. So it's like trying to find that, that opportunity to make things happen. Uh, this project that I'm working on is looking into sort of tackling the sanitation from like four big perspectives. And one is the political side of things. So making sure that they are maybe not regulations in itself, like a law that says that you have to do this, but at least standards or something that can people use as, as guidance. The second is to pilot a couple treatment systems that people could use as, a, a, I don't know, as a learning ground. And attaching to that a finance mechanism, which is how, if we were to, to scale or deploy this to another community, what kind of financial mechanisms would they implement? What, what things are, are out there that could be copied to finance the construction and then later the operation of these treatment systems? And of course, the fourth is like, how do we communicate all this to the community? Make sure that there's awareness. Yeah. And, you know, water issues can be super hyper local, right? Just because the supplies are different and where they go are different. So how then do you deal with that hyper localness of water issues? The strategy so far is working with the local community in the form, what, whatever form is that they're organized. It might be an association of. So, for example, we're in, in Honduras, we're working in a community that is, um, so it's like 300 meters of, of beachfront. And there's a bunch of little like restaurants that offer fish and, and seafood to mainly local tourists from Honduras. They'll come on the weekend and, and sort of enjoy the view of the beach. And they want to have a little bit of fish, but then the wastewater from these little restaurants are dumped into the same beach that are that it's like their sort of asset, right, to attract these tourists. Well, at least this project is looking at is how can we pipe these this wastewater and treat it? But then you have the issue of like, do we have a public land to put a treatment plant? And who wants a treatment plant next to their restaurant? Can we do small decentralized treatment systems, right? So each restaurant have their own thing. Can they even manage the operation of this? How are they organized? So at the end, we end up realizing that there are, there are obviously the community is organized somehow. And so it's trying to leverage that in search of a sanitation solution for them and to them. So in some ways, can you take a technology and then just plop it into that community? Or do you have to, again, customize and tweak for that community? There's always customization. At the end, 
the technologies out there ends up looking like a menu. And so you have all these set of technologies, and then you look at the set of sort of conditions of the sites and you say, well, for this conditions, we can use maybe this, this, and this technology and put it together, design it well and hope, and then obviously construct well and then train the local community to operate well. Tell us a little bit about your work right now at GIZ and how it tries to approach and tackle some of these water issues in Costa Rica. As I mentioned, so this is this is actually a GEF a GEF project, and it's implemented by two organizations, the uh, IDB uh, and uh, UNIP. And so both organizations have their own set of sort of components. In the IDB side, IDB decided to hire the German Agency for International Cooperation (GIZ) to execute their side of activities. And just clarification, IDB is the International Development Bank. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry for the, yeah. for the acronyms. And UNEP, the UN Environmental Program, right? Yes, correct. Sorry. Yeah, so for DI set a set of activities, uh, the project is looking into, into these four components that I mentioned, the, the way the project is trying to tackle water and sanitation. Obviously, you know, Jimmy, these, these projects are... They're not solving the the sanitation problem. We're, we're it's almost like an exploration of if an approach of this sort of four areas, if they have an effect, and then eventually is how do we scale this up or how do we use these experiences to to scale it up? But my role now it's it's more like a like a regional and technical advisor for for the project for the implementation of all the activities. So. My job day to day is mainly, you know, speaking with which each of the country representatives, which are typically ministries of environment, and trying to work with them and figuring out how we're going to tackle this. The biggest struggle now is, is yeah, it's just you know the, the time and days. I haven't been been able to visit any of these projects um, and see it for them myself. So it's it's tricky. That's sort of my role, trying to put things together and make sure things are are moving forward. Going into your role a little bit more deeply, what would you say is your critical skill that you're bringing to the team in, in pushing these projects forward? I think something that I have found very valuable as a, in my personal side, trying to, or my, or my ability not to losing the, my way in the sense of keeping in the core, what is it that drives us in this project, right? So it's like a cleaner Caribbean. And so just having that like impact side of things very present helps me think of when I'm talking to a country, really becoming that advisor that it's focused on this issue and not in opposition. If I were to think about only, you know, what would look good for my resume, what would look good for the for the organization or what would look good for for IDB in this case, then I think the project could be steered very differently. So if I were to say my biggest asset is just being passionate about what the problem is, obviously having that combo of experience from you know agriculture side of things, because this, pro this project actually is looking also into implementation of, I want to say innovative circular economy solutions, for example, reuse of effluent for agriculture. And so having that combo of like looking at that whole value chain of things of, from my agriculture, knowledge from my bachelor's, wastewater from my master's, and now with the MBA, sort of this project management of things, putting all that into combo and keeping that core goal in mind is the, the biggest thing I bring to the team. Yeah, and certainly being from Costa Rica and working on this project in Costa yeah. Rica, you're also taking care of your backyard for yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. intents and purposes. How important do you think it is to work with local representatives then to take care of one's own problem? I think it's key. I mean, I've witnessed projects where, and without you know this discrediting at all the the value of, of international consultants bring to a to a project. But sometimes that lacking of local context and that local context is not like, oh, well, I've, you know, I've done, you know, projects here and there in, in this X country, but it's just sort of understanding even how people speak. And, you know, for example, every time I'll, I'll, I'll have a call with a certain country, I know they're going to be late. I know that if we schedule a two o'clock call, they're going to show up at literally 2.30, right? So when they connect to 2.30, you're, you're, you're like, hey, you're early. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> but if you you're you're not even from the context, then you get frustrated at two twenty. You hang up, and then you send this rough email saying, "I waited for you guys. You didn't show up," and that's how things don't move forward. So it's that local context is like so so important. Can you describe the web of interacting parts? When you're now trying to pull these projects together, how many different components, how many different sectors are you trying to pull together to keep focused in on the sanitation outcome? That's a tough question. There's a lot of stakeholders. I mean, the more we dig, the more we ask who's involved in this or who's involved in that, more names come up, more meetings come up, and then you find that the web of water and sanitation in the region it's immense. There's a lot of people pushing forward in the same direction, not necessarily in, in synchrony, but I mean, you have local, uh, say governmental partners like municipalities play a very important role because at the end of the day, they're responsible for anything that happens locally. You have sort of private associations of the community that is organized or say in this case of Honduras restaurant owners, they're, they're organized together. You have, you know, individual communities in themselves, then you have the, the government, which is typically an umbrella of, of the ministries that are responsible for the, the, the regulations that are related to water, then in some cases, not in all countries, but then you have the providers of that service, so water providers, then you have the wastewater providers. Sometimes there's an interesting trend of the transition of these providers moving also into sanitation, and then obviously there's the funding side. The web, it's undescribable. One of the first things when I started this project, I was like, obviously coming from, from Oxford and, and, and the Skull Center, I was like, oh, have you mapped the system? Have you, you know, is there, is there, is there something that I could see that just to have an idea? And then they, they haven't worked on it. In our earlier conversation, we were talking about the importance of stakeholder maps yeah. and just understanding who the moving parts are and where all the moving parts are. That takes a while just to, to understand We've been throwing around water and wastewater as if they're synonymous. And sometimes they are one company that does both. And sometimes they're two companies that does one does water and one does wastewater. How does that interaction work then? And do you have, through your experience then, notice which one works better? So here, at least in the region, we've what we've noticed is that it's typically just one provider, specific example. So Suriname, they have the, the water provider, and they focus on water infrastructure, only water. But obviously the region, it's coming to realize that the cycle is one cycle, right? So you produce water or you collect water, you transfer that water, you use that water, but then you have to treat that water. It's, it's just one, uh, it's a one chain. You can't just say, I'm gonna do half of that chain. And so many of these providers are moving or transitioning into also providing sanitation instead of having a different company do that. So it's an interesting trend. They're starting to sort of specialize in it. They're trying to get their their head wrapped around how do we provide water and sanitation at the same time. It makes a lot of sense, Jimmy, because usually they already have a system that they're you know charging users for water. So it wouldn't be too hard to start ch charging for sanitation as well if things kind of make sense, even just in that same water bill. They already own part of the underground infrastructure of, of piping, and so it wouldn't be too hard to do the, the, the sewage. Um, the tricky part is always the land for, for treatment plants and the discharge of, this, of the treated effluent. I mean, it's very locally dependent. To add one more level of complexity, not just water, wastewater, but let's bring agriculture back into it. Mm -hmm. We think of the water agriculture nexus as primarily watering of plants. But then there's also a second problem, which is phosphorus, agricultural phosphorus dissolved in the water. Can you describe that a little bit since you did some projects on that too? One of the, th I think the issues or the challenges is that we've segregated very strongly agriculture and, and cities, right? So urban and, and rural areas. Many of the wastes that are generated in the urban areas are an amazing resource for the rural areas, but they never make it because there's, you know, if there's a lot of, there's literally, a, you know, space in between. You can't just pipe the, the treated effluent all the way to agricultural land. But then there's sort resources such as, which you mentioned it now, which almost brings me, throws me back all the way to those teenage years of, of saying, hey, what can we do with this? Uh, Wayawa fruit. In the case of phosphorus, 
we are now uh, experiencing, and we say we, we refer as, uh, I refer as, as humanities experiences, this wave of realizing that we've been moving phosphorus around. And phosphorus is a, is a nutrient that is very important for plants. And unlike nitrogen and some of the other nutrients, the places where you can find phosphorus are limited to only maybe three to four places in the world. So we've been mining this phosphorus from these places. We send them to, say, an, an agriculture field in the U.S., in Brazil, in Argentina, or literally everywhere. And then we move that food around the world, which is consumed, and then we ended up wasting it in our wastewater, and that wastewater flows down into the ocean. So we're literally just grabbing that phosphorus and sending it back to the ocean. And that's an issue in the sense that these sites where phosphorus is, it's documented that the just as oil, it's, it's a non-renewable source. Um, where we're going to run out in X amount of years, dating about the, that number. So I won't, I won't share it, but some studies talk about 50, 60 years, which is huge because it's the, the sort of one of the, the main pillars of agriculture, phosphorus. Nitrogen, un, unlike nitrogen, you can produce nitrogen from air. Right? You just put a machine, turn it on, and then you produce nitrogen. But phosphorus, you can't do that. And so one of the things that I looked at at uh, my time at Oxford was, can we create a business where we can extract this phosphorus from wastewater before it leaves the treatment plant? Can we make it into this transportable product and then send it back to agriculture? So now we actually, this coming weekend, I'm going to start a little pilot that we already built a little pilot machine. We're going to turn it on this weekend and see if we can produce uh, phosphorus from wastewater. Uh, and when we say we is my team from from the MBA, the Entrepreneurship Project team, we, we stayed in touch and we're trying to put a, a little startup. We'll see what, where it takes us. Good luck on that. It's a critical problem. Not many people know of peak phosphorus as a concept. They might have heard of peak oil, but peak phosphorus is just as critically important to the way society and the global economy works. Yeah, it's a big issue. Um, I mean, uh, China, I think in 2008, caught up on it and said, well, we're going to reduce the export of phosphorus because they have a big big mines and that really fueled things price went up quite a bit and so it, it kind of made an alert of that this big phosphorus is coming coming close we've talked about several different systems now the agriculture system the water system sanitation system and then all the stakeholder groups that come together when you're getting introduced to this system how do you start teasing it apart and how do you start understanding the system dynamics so for every for all the countries that we've been that I've been involved in so far is usually you could do you know a bottom up or top down approach um, looking at say top down looking at the legislation how is sort of the government thinking about this the issue and then trickling down all the way down to a community level and seeing how that is being implemented who are the players. And then you'll see where the gaps are. And that, that's at least an approach. You could also do the same thing just backwards, right? But in, in essence, that's the way that we've been approaching it, sort of looking at that whole chain of effects and seeing where the gaps are and, and how we could you know, intervene. Basically doing a stakeholder map and seeing where there's stakeholders missing. Yeah, stakeholders and also actions. What is harder then? Is it to get tasks and initiatives implemented or is it to try to move the systems and shift the system? Like how do you create those systemic shifts? For sure, you need to activate sort of all the stakeholders. I mean, we, as we've all known and learned is that there's no one entity that can solve this issue anyway. So it's how, how do you have everyone who's interested in being involved and that should be involved involved and actively doing something about it? So activating the local communities and the municipalities and the government. I think if, if everyone is sort of pitching their things, I think things can move quite a bit, but it's usually there are some missing gaps. Funding infrastructure is it's an important one. So how do we channel money through that? Well, I mean, even going back to your agriculture days and biogas days, what I'm curious about is when do you think you first noticed these interconnected webs of moving parts? And when did you decide that you could do something about it? Hmm. I, I have like a, you know how those things when you, when you think of something and you have like a flavor in your mouth or a smell comes up, uh, something like that. That's, that's how I feel with that question is I sort of remember feeling 
or having that the, the feeling of sort of seeing that missing connection and realizing, oh, this there's an interesting gap here that we you know we can fill. How is not anyone looking into this or talking to people and be like, no, that went, no way, that's not going to work. What was the expression going down to the shop? Is it that the expression maybe? Like if you're at a, of a at a factory, right, and you're a manager, you're looking from up and you look things, think something is not working. But if you stay up there, then uh, things are going to continue not working. But if you go down the stairs and go into the shop and see what the issue is and start talking to people, you obviously will find the issue and will come up with ways to solve it. And I think that is the case in this in this particular water sanitation is that if we don't visit communities, if we don't try to understand what their issues, what their motivations are, there is no way we're going to get anywhere. Well, what's critical to what you're talking about is noticing what's missing. You've mentioned it earlier in terms of noticing the gaps. And even if we go back to your biodigester example early ago, it was noticing that there was a missing step in the deployment of that technology. How would you describe this sense of noticing what's missing versus noticing what's there? Wow. Um, I don't know, Jimmy. This, I mean, again, it's like talking to just being on the ground and, and, and trying to, I don't know, maybe asking, I don't want to say tough questions because it's uh, maybe that, that, that expression is overrated, but it's, it's not asking tough questions, but it's asking why. Well, why, why hasn't, you know, anyone done this? And has this, you know, just kind of being very curious, I guess, curiosity brings into this making, it helps you make that differentiation between what's there and what's missing. That inquiry, the, the naivety in some ways of coming in, perhaps that's the benefit of coming in as an outsider, mm -hmm. where you can ask the basic fundamental questions, yeah. tease it apart a little bit, and then try to figure out what's been overlooked for all intents and purposes. Yeah, yeah, that uh, exercise maybe of unlearning, that's also an overrated expression, but um, just that, ex I mean, the essence of, it is very difficult. If, you, if you're if you a specialist in a water and sanitation world and you go in to look into a water sanitation, it's just hard to unlearn the things that you've noticed before to really pay attention to those differences. As a professional, I think that, we ought to be very humble and, and say, well, I, you know, I don't know it, everything. I need to step back, try to unlearn the things that I've learned so far and see if I notice a difference. And what I can guarantee is that typically there is. So then when you approach problem solving, what are the properties of your approach to problem solving then? I think just the way I described it is literally just kind of being humble enough to enter an arena and maybe you you, you feel like you know everything, you've been around uh, long enough in a certain sector, but it's taking that time and say, well, how would I be looking at this if I was that, you know, teenage boy looking at, you know, Wajawa trees on the, on the ground? Then I was looking at how do I extract water from, from these Wajawas as I'm holding an umbrella and it's just like pouring, right? So my mind wasn't like connecting the two. But it's maybe sometimes is that that childish thinking that lets you see through something else that you didn't notice. But as an adult or as a as a senior or an engineer or whatever, you look at the water, you're like, oh, let's just harvest rainwater. But then you miss the opportunity. Maybe as a, you're looking at the wajawas, you see a worm, you're like, oh, this is interesting. I didn't notice this worm. And then that takes you somewhere else. So maybe being humble and, and unlearning to learn, to relearn. Coming to uh, some of the urban, peri-urban and rural issues, do you see a type of urban growth that's more sustainable than others? From a sanitation perspective? Yeah. One thing that I think the region has learned, and this is not only region, uh, even the sector of wastewater, is trying to avoid the centralization of sanitation in such immense areas. So, for example, U.S. has been centralizing treatment of cities for very long, and they've come to realize that that is very expensive and, and sometimes even unmanageable, and they started to decentralize treatments. This idea of this project in Honduras, where we're just sort of connecting the wastewater from this sort of block, taking it to this smaller treatment plant, uh, and the treatment plant has this idea of more like nature-based solution. Nature-based solution is also a, a, an interesting trend. 
of using not these very high tech technologies, but something that wastewater just kind of flows, goes through these process. There's no pumping, there's no aeration, there's no equipment. Uh, so it's easy to maintain, cheap to maintain, and still achieving decent effluent. I think that approach of like decentralizing things, making things a bit smaller and letting the community manage these systems is a trend that we're noticing that is a bit more functional than saying, let's do a huge you know, sewer system for the whole city of X, and then this mega treatment plant, that's what we've, we've noticed. So that, that would be a trend that I would definitely identify. That's a fascinating trend because generally speaking, most infrastructure tries to centralize and consolidate for efficiencies of scale. But what you're saying is in water treatment, you, they're, they're notice, we're noticing benefits of the decentralization and the localized management of. Yeah, those economy, there's economies of scale. Sometimes it doesn't necessarily hit for water and sanitation. So why is that? Like, what is unique about water and wastewater business model that makes it so that way decentralization is preferable? I think a strong sort of needle or the, the things that moves the needle is the piping of wastewater. So obviously putting sewer systems around a city and then taking it, you know, miles away, that uh, tends to be very expensive for uh, just the piping itself, the infrastructure, and especially pumping. Um, that water. And then another is the size of treatment systems that arise from these very centralized systems. You have to be very efficient because you have now a lot of wastewater that you need to treat in a, the, typically a sort of smaller size treatment system. So you have to do a very, very technological systems, which are very energy intensive and chemical uh, intensive. While if you des decentralize it, Yes, by scale, you're going to need a larger treatment plant by scale, but it's doable, right? Like in all these communities, there are usually properties that can be used for that, that are not being used. Uh, and then you can implement nature-based solutions that don't require as much energy or chemical input. So at the end, when you look at it, uh, it tends to be more efficient to do these decentralized systems. And then it, also, if you think about it, it, it tends to be a bit more resilient because if this one treatment system fails or if this one sewer line gets plugged, then it's the whole city that it's an issue. Decentralization gives you a little bit more resilience in, in terms of, of sanitation as well. Final question. To a student or an early career professional, what skill or expertise would you encourage them to learn? Not Typically nothing that it's in a textbook. All these, all, <laughs> all these things are, you know, you can learn over time, but I think that uh, a skill that I mentioned already that was very, that has been very valuable is what is the driver of why you're involved in a project? Obviously, I'm coming from an impact side of things. It's what I've worked all over, all, all through my career, and it's what I expect to continue doing. A skill is to not to learn how to keep that as a center of your work, and not deviating and following, say, money or following what good looks in a in a CV. But like, if you follow what an issue or just something that you're passionate about, that I think that's a skill that. Um, not not everyone knows how to manage, learn, use, exploit. In essence, don't deviate from your values. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. Jimmy, this was very fun. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Levers of Exchange podcast, where we share ideas, knowledge, and best practices for achieving a sustainable future. I'm the host, Jimmy Gia, and the music is by Sean Hart. Thanks again to the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at the Said Business School, Oxford University, for sponsoring Season 3 of this podcast. Please subscribe to our podcast for new episodes and share with a friend. Please visit our website at www.leversofexchange.com for additional episodes, books, and other resources. Thank you again. And remember, the clean tech economy will require everyone's participation. How can we exchange ideas today to help you find your role tomorrow?